All right, hello and welcome to the last video lecture of the semester. I'm sure you're very excited about that. Uh, we're going to talk about reconstruction this lecture here. And let's get started. First thing I want you to know is the planning for reconstruction started before the Civil War was over. Uh, reconstruction, this is how we're going to put the country back together after the Civil War is over. And Lincoln came up with what's known as the 10% plan. So Lincoln's 10% plan, also known as the Proclamation of Amnesty and Reconstruction. Uh, but it's better known as the 10% plan. Uh, what Abraham Lincoln wanted to do is he wanted to make it where a minority of voters, equal to 10% of the people who voted for president in 1860, uh, they would take an oath of allegiance to the United States, and then they would approve emancipation, and they would formally end slavery. So that's why it's known as the 10% plan, because all he had to do was find 10% of the people who voted in 1860 who would say, I love America and slavery bad. Once that 10% was found, that minority could create a new state government, and then uh, he would exclude all Confederate military leaders and all Confederate officials from holding office or voting or anything like that. Also, Abraham Lincoln said no African-American voting. He did not want blacks to vote. Um, Abraham Lincoln, while he did not like slavery, once again, he was not exactly equal rights. <clears throat> uh, overall, Lincoln's plan is a slap on the list, or slap on the wrist, I should say. And the reason for that is because, once again, Abraham Lincoln was a politician. Um, he wanted people to see that he wasn't going to punish the South, and he wanted people to leave or abandon the Confederate ideas. And then he wanted to build a Republican Party in the South. So he was hoping if the people in the South see this is just a slap on the wrist, they'll quit fighting and they'll come back home like a child that's run away. <clears throat> Overall, that didn't please Congress. And so Congress is going to come up with their own solution and it's called the Wade Davis bill and it's Benjamin Wade and Henry Davis Benjamin Wade is from I think it's Ohio and Henry Davis I can't remember where he's from right now but Benjamin Wade and Henry Davis are gonna come up with their own idea and instead of 10% like Lincoln said it's gonna be 50% you're going to have to find 50% of the voters who cast a vote in 1860. They're going to have to take an oath to the United States, and they're going to have to approve emancipation. Once that's done, that majority could then elect delegates to rewrite their constitution for their state. And in that constitution, they have to formally repeal secession. They have to formally abolish secession, meaning that a state could never leave the country again. It becomes illegal. On top of that, the person has to take what's called an ironclad oath, meaning that they never, ever, not even once, supported the Confederacy. Now, if you think about it, that's a lot harder, because what is considered support? If you send a letter to your family member who's a soldier, is that support? If you sent a care package, is that a support? So there were some real questions with this Wade Davis bill. And just like Lincoln's 10% plan, the Wade Davis bill, no voting for black Americans. Now what happens is Congress refuses to pass Lincoln's 10% plan. So it does not become law. Lincoln refuses to sign the Wade Davis bill. It doesn't become law. So when the Civil War is over, there are exactly zero plans on what to do for Reconstruction. They have to also have to plan for emancipation. They have to plan for freedom for the slaves. And that starts in 1863. Um, January 1st, 1863, Lincoln produces and publishes the Emancipation Proclamation, and that's what makes the war about slavery. It was always about slavery, but that's what brings slavery to the forefront and makes it, yes, this is what the war is about. Problem is, there's no plan created by the government on what to do. Uh, they're not sure who's going to be in control of emancipation. Uh, they, they're they fighting between the Army and the Treasury Department. The Army, the Army has the men, the Treasury Department has the money. But at the same time, 
the army only has enough supplies for itself. There are also questions about who else would assist. Would private businessmen have something to do with this? Would church missionaries have something to do with this? Would the freedmen and abolition groups have something to do with this? So there's really, there's no plan. When it comes down to it, there are three main groups who are going to handle emancipation. The first group who very often are the first to meet these slaves is the U.S. Army. They can only assist for a short amount of time because they only have enough supplies for the army. So what would very often happen is the army might give these former slaves uh, some food, a blanket, maybe a tent, and then they would continue on. Then you have U.S. Treasury agents, and their main goal, treasury, money, they want to find out a way to make money out of this, and they want to get former slaves back to work as quickly as possible because then those former slaves could bring in tax money and the government doesn't have to spend money to support these former slaves. And then there's some private businessmen. Uh, there are a lot of private businessmen from the north who come south. They lease farmland taken from southerners and they want these former slaves to work the land. And ultimately, these former slaves are going to be used for labor. One way or the other, they're going to be used for labor. Now, when these former slaves get their freedom, it's not always an immediate thing. Some don't leave right away because they want to make sure it's safe. Some just can't believe that they're free. And then there are others who just aren't sure what to do. And for very many people, the first step is finding their family. Uh, in slavery, family members were very often torn apart. Siblings were sold. Husbands and wives were sold, and they have to figure out, how do we find the family? Once you put the family back together, then where are we going to live? Are we going to stay where we are now, or are we going to try to make it in the city? What are we going to do? And then, how are we going to make a living? Are we all going to be farmers? Are we going to try to work in the city? Is it just the male figure who's going to vote, the male and the female figure? Is it the entire family? You get the idea. And there are also questions about where are they going to receive assistance. Now, speaking of assistance, most of that is provided by the Freedmen's Bureau, um, which is actually officially known as the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. Now, what the Freedmen's Bureau is going to do, it's going to give food to these former slaves, it's going to give clothing, legal assistance to these former slaves, medical care, and some education. Now, the legal assistance is very important because a lot of these slaves can't read, and the Freedmen's Bureau is going to double check that they are getting legit contracts. Now you also have these Northern Missionary Societies, these uh, church groups who are going to set up schools based on the work they've done in Africa. They're going to take their experience in places like Liberia and Western Africa and try to superimpose that on the American South. And then you have African American churches that are set up uh, that's meant to allow blacks to form their own community, uh, to develop community leaders. There's also education involved in that, I think Sunday, Sunday school, and then a place to worship as well. Now, what are the conditions of these former slaves? Well, truthfully, a lot of the jobs they're doing are the same as the old jobs they did. Uh, if a person worked as a field hand, they're going to find jobs as a field hand. If they were a household servant, they're going to find jobs in household settings. Um, now, blacks are free to receive pay, but there's not a whole lot else that changes for them. And the what little pay they are given, that's got to be spent for food, clothing, and medical care. So really their conditions are the same it's just they become paid instead of not paid now what's really weird is labor was forced it's labeled a public duty and all throughout the south uh, there are laws passed that make it a crime to be considered a vagrant if you are unemployed or if you're homeless you go to jail and that is developed into black codes now let me say real quick black codes and jim crow are not the same thing. Now, that might be important for your final exam, so pay attention. 
black codes are not the same as Jim Crow. Black codes are going to start in 1865 and go up into the middle of the 1870s. Jim Crow starts in the 1880s and go up, goes up into the early 1900s. So black codes are not Jim Crow. Jim Crow is not black codes. There is a difference between the two. But with these black codes, like I said, it's illegal to be unemployed. And if you're unemployed, you can go to jail. And if you go to jail, to get out of jail, you have to pay a fine. Well, if these former slaves don't have money because they're unemployed, they definitely can't pay their fine. So what happens? Former slave owners will pay to get them out of jail. And then that former slave must work for a former slave owner and pay off their debt. Some of these black codes even restrict movement. They forbid you from owning land. You can only rent land in some cases. And there are even some black codes that say you can't rent land. It's a crime to break a contract. It's a crime to assemble. And it's a crime to insult a white person. So these black codes are very nebulous, if you will. It's very easy to, to break them. It's very easy to go into jail. The whole purpose is to try and regain control of society. Now we got President Andrew Johnson, and you can see there a picture of him. He's not a very happy looking guy. A couple things about Andrew Johnson. First of all, he was not a Republican. He was a Democrat. Lincoln's second term as president, it was not a Republican ticket. It was a joint ticket between a Republican and a Democrat to try and bring the country together. So Andrew Johnson, when he becomes president after Lincoln is shot in April of 1865, he is very strong in support of the South, and he thinks the South is doing just fine. In 1866, when the Freedmen's Bureau Act is passed, he vetoes it. And in 1866, when the Civil Rights Act is passed, he vetoes that as well. Because Johnson wants to do things his way and give the South a slap on the wrist, Congress does not like him, and Congress is actually going to impeach him and put him on trial. Now, the story behind this, I don't have a lot of time to tell it. Uh, Congress passed a law that said that the president could not remove people from their positions, and that's completely against the Constitution, and Andrew Johnson knew it. So he tried to fire the Secretary of War, which would today be the Secretary of Defense. And because Andrew Johnson tried to fire his Secretary of Defense or Secretary of War, whatever you want to call it, Congress accused Andrew Johnson of high crimes and misdemeanors. And in the trial, Johnson is going to keep the presidency by one vote. And this group of people called Radical Republicans are going to take over Congress afterwards, and Johnson's really not going to have a chance to do anything because he has lost so much power. So we get this period called Radical Reconstruction. And before Radical Reconstruction, here is your word of the day, and this is your last secret word. Your secret word is study. Um, once you get done with your research paper, take some time to study for your final. Um, when you study for your final, you'll do better on the final. So your secret word is study. All right, so radical reconstruction. We've got the Reconstruction Act of 1867. And what that's going to do is it's going to invalidate all of the state governments Andrew Johnson approved. So all the reconstruction work that had been done so far basically is scratched out. The only state government that's allowed to stay is Tennessee, and that's just kind of a courtesy to Andrew Johnson since that's his home state. Doesn't mean Tennessee was doing better than anywhere else. It was just, okay, we'll give you one. The Reconstruction Act is also going to create five military districts throughout the South, and the South is going to be put under martial law. There are going to be American or U.S. Union soldiers patrolling the South. Any state constitution has to guarantee black suffrage, meaning the right to vote for African Americans. And African Americans have to be allowed to vote before a state can be readmitted to the Union. 
The other thing the radical reconstructionists are going to do, they're going to refinance the Freedmen's Bureau, and Republicans are going to dominate the South. Now, a quick note on that. I know today most Southern elected officials are Republican. That's a fairly new thing. It started in the uh, early 2000s. From basically 1876 until 1990 or so, every single position of power in the South was controlled by a Democrat. So I just want to make sure you know that this is different than what's happening today. Now, southern state governments, they're dominated by Republicans, and the way that's done is because a lot of the southerners aren't allowed to vote, and then the former slaves are allowed to vote. The former slaves overwhelmingly vote Republican, and a lot of white voters aren't allowed to vote, and that's how the Republicans are able to get control of the South, at least temporarily. Now, there are a lot of attacks against Reconstruction. Uh, there are political attacks, and there are violent attacks. Um, the most famous of these violent groups is the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. It starts as a social club in Pulaski, Tennessee. It's founded by a guy named Nathan Bedford Forrest. And eventually it goes from a social club into a violent group, and they are pretty much equal opportunity hate. They target black voters, white Republicans, leaders of the Freedmen's Bureau and the Union. And another thing, the KKK we have today is not the same KKK. This KKK lasts uh, up until the early 1870s, and then the KKK is reborn in the 19-teens. So there have been a couple iterations of the KKK. Now, when these violent attacks come out, Congress is going to respond with something called the Enforcement Act and the KKK Act and it outlaws the KKK violence and it allows the federal government to arrest and prosecute Klan members. Now last but not least, there are three Reconstruction Era Amendments and these are important to know. The 13th Amendment on December 6th, 1865, that's the day it's ratified. The 13th Amendment officially ends slavery. The 14th Amendment is ratified on July 9th, 1868, and that's what made all former slave citizens and officially reversed the Dred Scott case. And then the 15th Amendment is ratified on the 26th of February, 1869, and that gave the right to vote to all males. Now, even though it says the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state, on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. It doesn't say anything about money. It doesn't say anything about taxes. So Southerners are going to find other ways to keep African Americans from voting. All right, so that is it for your lectures. It's been an interesting semester, and I think fall is going to be just as interesting. If any of you are going to take fall classes, make sure that you sign up sooner rather than later, because we're looking at how many classes we can offer face-to-face -face versus how many we need to offer online. So uh, make sure you do that. Also, your museum review is due next week on the 26th, the last day of class. Remember, you can do any of those virtual museums or you can watch any of those movies. How long should the museum review be? About three pages. It's uh, double the length of a reflection paper. And then this Sunday, you've got your last set of discussion questions, your last quizzes and your last reflection paper and your research paper. So there's a lot of stuff due this weekend. Uh, don't wait till the last minute, but um, it's been a pleasure. Hope to see some of you face-to-face -face in the fall. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.